What exactly makes the John Wick franchise so special? On the surface, it may seem like it's the iconic and unparalleled action, but I think it's actually more complicated than that. You see, the John Wick franchise has received near endless praise from fans and critics alike, and while all of it is more than well deserved, I think an unfair amount of focus is given to moments like this. Don't get me wrong, the fight sequences, gun fu, and stunt choreography are all Oscar worthy in their own right, but they aren't what makes this franchise special. While the movies would definitely be less enjoyable to watch if the fight scenes looked like this, the hyper-efficient, laser-focused storytelling would still make these action flicks some of the best pieces of cinema in the genre. So today, let's dive into how the seemingly simple story actually contains a deceptive amount of depth, and how the John Wick franchise rediscovered the lost art of good action movies. With the 80s and early 90s largely being considered the heyday of action flicks, the genre's trajectory has largely sloped downward ever since. Sure, plenty of blockbusters still contain action, but the classic guns akimbo, man on a mission, explosions front and center projects have almost completely vanished from mainstream Hollywood theatrical releases. Now, they're mostly relegated to thumbnails you scroll past while looking for something else on Amazon Prime. They often have names like Big Guns or The Man with the Doctor's Appointment, except the doctor isn't a person, it's a bullet. But why has the action genre fallen so far from grace? Well, a lot of that has to do with one simple fact. Action isn't enough to make a movie good. We have to care about the characters and their story in order for the fights to mean anything. Looking back at the heyday of the genre, movies like Rambo, Terminator, or Lethal Weapon all had meaningful things to say besides just Cool guys don't look at explosions. However, this ancient wisdom of how to make a good action movie was seemingly forgotten about entirely. At least, that was the case until one man came along to revitalize the genre. Just about every possible element of the John Wick franchise is designed with story in mind. So let's dive into them one at a time. First, let's talk about the characters. The film stars Keanu Reeves, an actor who's practically synonymous with classic action movies. This makes the familiar tropes feel like nostalgic callbacks, rather than just derivative writing. John Wick as a character kind of feels like a culmination of all the roles that Reeves has portrayed in the past, further contributing to his mystique and significance. Additionally, the simple yet compelling revenge storyline facilitates facilitates the top-notch action, as well as a subtle but powerful character arc for the protagonist. See, the first John Wick movie is primarily the story of John's grieving process. While the explicit reasoning for John's rampage is that he stole John Wick's car, sir, and uh, killed his dog. John eventually reveals that when Ellen died, I lost everything until that dog arrived on my doorstep. In that moment, I received some semblance of an opportunity to grieve on the law. While the movie doesn't shove this subplot down your throat, the storytelling subtly depicts his grief throughout the runtime, with the cinematography doing a great deal of heavy lifting. Take for example this shot from just after his wife's funeral. John is hosting a wake with a great many people, most of whom were probably closer with Helen than with him, but he isn't interacting with any of them. He's emotionally isolated even if he's physically far from being alone. When John receives the puppy Helen left for him as a final gift, her letter explains that I'm sorry I can't be there for you, but you still need something, someone to love. So start with this. John's habit of self-isolation is such a core part of who he is that his wife is able to predict how he will react to her own death. The puppy is an integral part of John being able to heal, which is why it's such a big deal when Vigo's son breaks in and fast forwards to the end of Marley and Me. 
See, while John is a man who deals in death, he takes no pleasure in it. At least, not anymore. His main objective is closure. His relationship with Helen was meant to be a new start, a chance for a peaceful existence. So when Yosef destroys the last tangible piece of Helen's love, the only path towards closure the boogeyman can now see is blood for blood. It's not personal. It's not even all that cathartic. When he finally kills Yosef, it's downright anticlimactic. John is operating on autopilot, dealing out vigilante justice, but not actually addressing his core issue. That's why the movie starts with a flash forward to after Wick has already killed Vigo. This is the path John's actions have led him down. All the violence and avenging doesn't change the fact that he is alone, bleeding out with only a fading memory of his late wife. But then this happens. It's okay. The real closure for John comes by way of love rather than revenge. Having a companion to take care of gives him the same sense of purpose and redemption that his time with Helen did. It's not his war path that rights the wrong of his losses. It's the continuation of love that allows John Wick to become whole once again. Now, like I said, the filmmakers don't beat you over the head with this throughout the movie, but this depth is there and really heightens the experience of the film, whether audiences consciously recognize it or not. This same depth of character is continued throughout the rest of the films as well. Throughout the franchise, John only ever attacks the people who come after him first, which is why the main plot of John Wick 2 centers around Santino D'Antonio forcing John to once again leave retirement in order to honor a blood oath. Now, according to the rules set in place by the high table, this is well within Santino's right to do, but the problem lies in the fact that he double crosses John. On, attempting to have him killed after Wick successfully eliminates his sister Gianna. Lou says. Now, even if we overlook the stupidity of trying to double cross someone you specifically hired due to their unmatched ability to finish what they start, Santino's treachery makes himself, like Yosef before him, the one thing standing between John and closure. Winston perhaps puts it best when he tells him, You stabbed the devil in the back and forced him back into the life that he had just left. Now he's free of the market. What do you think he'll do? John Wick overcomes every obstacle in his path, which is why 9 out of 10 doctors highly recommend you don't get in his way. Santino essentially authorizes his own execution order by forgetting one key detail about the man he is making an enemy. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. This is why even the rules of the Continental can't protect him once he and John finally come face to face. Sure, killing Santino means that he'll be excommunicado, but John can't leave this vendetta unresolved. He's willing to take on the entire criminal underworld because closure and a chance for peace is far more important to him than safety. We really see that idea explored in this conversation between John and Winston. You shoot me, you sell your soul, but I'll be alive and I can remember her until you die as a servant of the high table. The real question is, who do you wish to die as? The Baba Yaga or as a man who loved and was loved by his wife? John wants out, but forces beyond his control keep choosing to drag him back in. This story choice makes it so that John can simultaneously be an emissary of death and a sympathetic character we're rooting for throughout the franchise. It would have been easy to just make John Wick a one-dimensional badass, but by giving him such a compelling amount of depth, the audience actually has a reason to care about him accomplishing his goals. While on the subject of character, the supporting cast is equally important. To start with, the other assassins we meet throughout the franchise all have unique personalities, motivations, and skills, which accomplishes quite a few things simultaneously. First of all, it's just fun to watch. Seeing a quirky character like Zero try to kill John in Chapter 3 despite being a geeky fanboy for him is strangely endearing. Seeing 
seeing the heated rivalry between John and Cassian makes me desperately want to see a Hobbs and Shaw style team up between the two of them. Secondly, it fleshes out the world and backstory. Watching just how gleefully Perkins breaks continental rules to go after John really makes it seem like she has a personal vendetta against him. I personally assumed Perkins felt overshadowed by John, always wanting to be in the same tier as him, but never quite being good enough to match his skills. Lastly, the vividly realized assassins also reveal a great deal about John indirectly. You see that the younger, less experienced assassins don't show him the proper respect, arrogantly assuming he's past his prime and that he'll be an easy target. Meanwhile, those who know John, or at least were working at the same time he was, know exactly how formidable he truly is. Take for example Cassian and John just after he's taken out Gianna Santino. Cassian knows John, meaning he also knows that death follows him wherever he goes. He's unhappy to hear that he's working again because that means John is targeting Gianna. Furthermore, he's duty bound to try and kill John after what he's done to Gianna, but Cassian knows that trying to kill John hasn't ever worked out well for anyone up until this point. His respect for John, combined with the implication of a shared history, is why John ultimately spares him on the subway. The blade is in your aorta. You pull it out, you will bleed, and you will die. Consider this a professional courtesy. The same professional courtesy isn't something he offers the random thugs who come after him on the street. Having complex relationship dynamics like this efficiently tells us a great deal about both characters involved, which is why it's so fun to see John recognize someone else in the business. Are they old friends? Or maybe rivals? And regardless, are they foolish enough to fight John Wick? 14 million, it's a lot of money. Not if you can't spend it. Now, characters are nothing without a setting to exist in, and this is where my favorite element of the franchise comes into play, the world building. This might be a hot take, but I think Star Wars may very well have the best world building of any film franchise. This is because George Lucas constantly hints at a wider world, while staying focused on the actual story at the center of the film. When Luke says to Obi-Wan, You fought in the Clone Wars? Just about everyone watching the movie goes, what are the Clone Wars? But the thing is, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is that the world feels like it existed long before before the events of the movie began, that the galaxy far, far away is a living, breathing place. The John Wick franchise follows this same exact style of world building, and boy is it effective. Hearing characters allude to things like the High Table or other secretive factions gives the audience a reason to come back to each installment as they slowly explore more and more of the universe. Sure, secretive factions are not a new concept. But its use of these elements are so next level that the franchise has become the definitive version of those tropes, rather than just another iteration. Whether it's the High Table, the Bowery, the Ruska Roma, or the Sushi Dudes, all these factions existing simultaneously makes the world feel alive. Their battle for supremacy makes the plot dynamic and unpredictable. The Turf Wars, the Egos, the Double and Triple Crosses, it honestly reminds me a lot of Pirates of the Caribbean 3. And what becomes of Miss Swan? Elizabeth is not part of any bargain. You can keep Barbosa. Out of the question. Take Winston, for example. He's been John's most dedicated supporter throughout the franchise. Well, aside from John's dog. But even he betrays John when the adjudicator offers him a chance to reclaim the Continental. Now, is this a true double cross? Or is Winston simply securing his position now so that he can help John fight the high table later down the road? I honestly don't know, but I'm deeply excited to see this play out over the course of future movies. All of this complex ambiguity just adds to the world of these films, and the more developed the world is, the more impressive it is to see John Wick take it on all by himself. Tell them, whoever comes, I'll kill them all. So yeah, the gunfights are cool, Halle Berry's attack dogs are awesome, and John fighting motorcycles on horseback may very well be the dopest thing put to film. But it's not what makes this franchise special. Ultimately, John Wick rediscovered the lost art of making good action movies because it remembered one simple fact. 
good writing still matters. I'm Dylan, and this has been The Writer's Block.